Hello everyone, it's Professor Klorman here, post haircut. Ready to analyze some embellishing tones? Let's have a look. This harpsichord piece by François Couperin begins with a D minor scale in the bass. We use the term lament bass to refer to just this sort of bass line, a descent in minor from scale degree 1 down to scale degree 5. The first harmony is a tonic chord, and the passage arrives in measure 4 on a dominant triad for a half cadence. What about the chords in bars 2 and 3? We seem to have one harmony per bar. Can you tell which notes belong to the harmony in each measure? Let's listen once more. In this sort of a lament bass line, the descending natural minor scale, we often harmonize scale degree 7 the low form of scale degree 7, with a minor 5 chord. That's what we have here in measure 2, an A minor chord in first inversion. And measure 3, we have B flat in the bass, G, and D. That's a minor 4 chord in first inversion, which serves as the subdominant preparing for our half cadence. So now we've identified the harmonies. What about the embellishing tones? Starting with the melody, which notes in the melody do not belong to the chord? and which type of embellishing tone are they? So we have a series of neighboring notes in the melody, which become a pattern or a motive in this piece. We've explained almost every note in the passage, except for one. Let's have another listen and pay your attention to the tenor voice in measure three. How do we explain the A natural in the tenor? I notice that it's tied over from measure two into measure three which is a clue. Continuing to focus on measure three, the tenor, the A, let's talk about that note as a suspension. We've learned that suspensions have three parts, preparation, suspension, and resolution. Preparation means the note that's going to become a suspension is a chord tone in the previous harmony. So in measure two, the tenor has an A, and that A is part of the harmony, the A minor chord in measure two. Then that note is held over, that's shown here with a tie in the tenor, as there is a change of harmony. So that by measure three, we now have a G minor harmony. That tied over A, that suspended A, is now a non-chord tone, an embellishing tone, a dissonant note. And finally, we have the resolution when that A moves down by step to G on the third beat. That A, therefore, is a suspension. The G is the real chord tone. The chord is G, B flat, D. We can label the suspension by writing SUS for suspension, but a more traditional way to label it is to show it in the figures. So this is a 4-6 chord, a minor 4 chord of first inversion but we're going to label it as a 7-6 suspension. That means measuring up from the base, we have a 7th, B-flat up to A, that resolves to a 6th, B-flat up to G. That's what the 7-6 means. So when you see Roman numeral 4 with 7-6, that really means 4 6 but the note that is a sixth above the bass is delayed or decorated by a suspension. Let's turn now to a minuet composed by Ignatius Sancho. This minuet comes from a collection entitled Minuets for the Violin, Mandolin, or German Flute and Harpsichord, composed by an African. To explain the title a bit, first the African part, the composer was of African origin and was born on a slave ship in the Atlantic Ocean. As an infant, he was brought by his owner to England, where he ultimately escaped slavery and received a remarkable self-education and gained a reputation as a composer, actor, and man of letters. At the end of this video, 
you'll see his portrait as painted in 1768 by the acclaimed London painter Thomas Gainsborough. As for the title of his minuets, these were pieces written to be played on a melody instrument such as violin or flute, and to be accompanied by basso continuo on the harpsichord or another instrument. Sancho wrote only the melody and bass lines, but I've provided some harmony as implied by his bass line. As we listen to the minuet, think about embellishing tones in the melody and bass line. Dealing with the first eight measures, or the first system of music, let's have a look for passing tones. Passing tones can be divided into two categories, what I'm going to call regular passing tones, which are unaccented passing tones, and then accented passing tones. Those are cases where the passing tone is on a stronger beat than the note that it resolves to. So do you see any places with passing tones or with accented passing tones in the first eight measures of the piece. You can pause the video for a second to look for that. In this example, you can see that there's actually quite a few accented passing tones. I've marked them as P with an accent. So in the melody in measure two and four, you can see that the accented passing tone falls on a stronger position than the note that it resolves to. That makes it an accented passing tone. Usually, unaccented passing tones are more common, so we simply just call those passing tones, such as in the bass in measure two. To make a comparison, think about chocolate versus white chocolate. Normal chocolate is brown. White chocolate is a little more unusual, so we call it white. Same idea with passing tone versus accented passing tone. Now, we have a couple more non-chord tones to deal with in the melody toward the end of the system. In the last two bars in the melody, mi, re, do, si, si, la, how do you explain the downbeats of those two bars in the melody? The E in the downbeat of bar seven, and that little note B in the downbeat of bar eight. What kinds of embellishing tones are those? Let's start with the melody on the downbeat of bar seven, the E. It's an embellishing tone that's approached by a skip or a leap and then resolves down by step to a chord tone. In other words, the E is not part of the chord, but the D that follows is. Also, it's a strong beat dissonance. dissonance. The E falls on the downbeat, the D is on a weaker beat. We could call this an incomplete neighbor, as if it were D-E-D -E -D, with E as a neighbor to D, shortened to an incomplete neighbor, E decorating D. But there's an even more specific name we could use, appoggiatura, which I've written here as APP. The word appoggiatura comes from an Italian word appoggiare, meaning to lean. So you could think of it like the E leans on the D, or it depends on the D for its meaning. You could also think like a performer would tend to lean on the E, meaning we play the appoggiatura note a little bit louder usually than the note it resolves to. So, mi, re, do, si, si, la. An appoggiatura is an embellishing note on a strong beat, usually approached by leap or by skip, and it resolves by step to a chord tone, usually down by step. Sometimes, in, especially in the Baroque and classical periods, Appoggiaturas are written as little notes. This is what we see here in bar eight. The B is not a grace note meant to be played before the beat. The B is played on the beat, on a strong beat, like an appoggiatura, and it steals time from the note that follows. So a performer in Sancho's time period probably would have performed this mi, re, do, si, si, la, with the B on the beat, and the A a little bit later. That makes the B an appoggiatura, because it's a 
strong beat dissonance that resolves by step to a chord tone. By dissonance, I mean a non-chord tone or an embellishing note. Chord tone, of course, would be the main note. So let's listen to Sancho's minuet once again, and this time let's focus on non-chord tones, on embellishing notes in the second half, starting from measure 9. Looking at this minuet overall, we can see that passing tones, and to a lesser extent accented passing tones, are by far the most important, the most common type of embellishment. Passing tones are all over the place. The other embellishing tones we're studying are comparatively more rare. One final point I wanted to emphasize. When you're doing an analysis, look for patterns. For example, starting in measure 9, Fa, so, la, 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 so, fa, is repeated a step up. So, la, si, 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 la, so. Chances are the notes that are passing tones or accented passing tones in measures 9 and 10 will also be passing tones or accented passing tones in the corresponding places when that music is repeated a step up. So that might save you a little bit of time in your analysis. It won't always work, but it's something worth looking out for that can help you check your work and help you to analyze a little bit more quickly. Now let's have a listen to the horn solo from the slow movement of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony. Just wanted to point out we've just jumped forward over a century. This is one of the latest pieces chronologically we've listened to so far in the course. To help us get started, I've given a first uh, draft of an analysis underneath so you can see what the harmonies are. And I want to listen for embellishing notes in the melody, so notes that don't belong to the harmony. What type of non-chord tones or embellishing notes do we have? Let's work our way through the analysis. The hardest part of it is actually the upbeat right at the beginning, the re do si re do. I've marked those two notes with question marks. That's probably not a very satisfying answer. If you want to talk about those notes, send me an email or come see me in office hour and we can talk about the best way to label those. But I really want to focus on the rest of the passage. How about the re do? Well, the harmony there is an A dominant 7th chord, A, C sharp, E, G. So the D is, a embell is an embellishing note decorating the C sharp. The D is on a strong beat. It's approached by skip or by leap and resolves down by step. That is that special kind of incomplete neighbor that we refer to as a pagiatura. At the end of the bar, la, si, do, pretty clear that the B is a passing tone between the A and the C-sharp. Now let's follow my rule that if a melody is repeated up by step, if there's a sequential repetition, a repetition in a sequence, often we have the same patterns of embellishing notes. So for instance, Re, Do corresponds to Mi, Re. Here the E is approached by skip. It's a strong beat non-chord tone, it doesn't fit in the D major chord, and resolves down by step to a D. So that's again an appoggiatura. At the end of the bar, Re, Mi, Fa, pretty clearly a passing tone since the D and the F sharp are chord tones. Continuing with the melody, we'll deal with the melody and then we'll talk about the alto. Sol, 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 Fa. Well, in bar, um, in bar three of the excerpt, 
all of those G's in the melodies are chord tones, but in bar four, we have a D major chord with a G in the melody resolving to an F sharp. That G is a non-chord tone, an embellishing tone that resolves down by step to F sharp. So is that G in appoggiatura? Well, I've labeled it here actually as a suspension. What's the difference? A suspension we learned is a note that is prepared in the previous harmony and becomes a non-chord tone on, with the change of harmony. Here, we can imagine the melody is holding the G. Sol, 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 fa. So we sometimes refer to this as a restruck suspension. It's not the kind of suspension that is literally tied over, but in our imagination, we can hear all the Gs in measure three as the preparation for the G on the downbeat of measure four. That's why we call this a suspension or a restruck suspension. Turning now in measure three to the alto part, the first harmony is an E, G, B, D chord, a two chord. The D is the seventh of the chord, that's a chord tone. But in the second half of the bar, we have an A dominant seventh chord. That D in the alto is tied over. So uh, tied over from its preparation, it becomes a suspension and resolves down by step. Let's listen to the excerpt once more. I'd like you to focus in particular on the two types of embellishing notes that most commonly happen on strong beats. We have appoggiaturas and we have suspensions. Uh, um, Non-chord tones that fall on strong positions are especially flavorful, especially expressive, especially spicy. So let's listen to those in this excerpt from Tchaikovsky. Sometimes it can be interesting to compare what Tchaikovsky wrote to what he could have written. This will help us to illuminate the difference between appoggiaturas and suspensions. We've already seen how Tchaikovsky's version has suspensions on the, excuse me, has appoggiaturas on the downbeat of measure one and on the downbeat of measure two. To change it into a slightly different version, let's imagine what it would sound like if it had had suspensions. What's the difference well, suspensions and appoggiaturas are both embellishing notes on strong beats that resolve down by step to chord tones. So the difference is appoggiaturas are approached by leap or by skip, whereas suspensions have to be prepared. They're either tied over from a chord tone in the previous harmony, that's tied over from the preparation, or restruck by repeating the same note. So let's hear a slightly different version of the piece as if it were written with suspensions. And finally, let's compare to one more recomposed version. This is the blandest possible version of this passage because I've taken out Tchaikovsky's appoggiaturas and I've taken out the suspensions that I wrote. This version has chord tones on the downbeats of both bars. I think you'll hear just how much simpler or more bland it sounds, and by comparison, just how expressive the appoggiaturas or suspensions are, because they add dissonances on strong beats. Embellishing notes on strong beats add expression, add um, spice, add flavor, and you'll really miss them in this version where I took them out. I think we can all agree that the original was probably the best.
We'll end today by returning to harpsichord with a little uh, excerpt from Elisabeth Jacquet de la Gare, composed in 1687. So one of the earliest composed pieces we'll study in, in this course. We're going to look just at two passages uh, where it says, analyze here. The first passage we're going to think about as if we're in the key of G minor. Notice her key signature. She has just one flat in the key signature, but this piece is a G minor piece. There are a lot of E flats written in as accidentals. And then the second excerpt where it says analyze here, let's think of that part as if it's in D minor. So we're going to do the first part in G minor and the second part in D minor. Let's listen to the excerpt, then we'll look at the harmonies and the embellishing notes. Remember earlier in this video we talked about bass lines in minor that descend? I called those lament bass. We have something similar here at the beginning. Sol, sol, fa, bi, re. And it's harmonized here exactly the same way. We start with a G minor chord, G, B flat, D, where I have that F in the bass, that's a D, F, A, a minor five chord, followed by a minor four chord, I have E flat in the bass, above that C and G. Now on the next downbeat, a five chord, D, F sharp, A, that lasts for the whole bar. By the end of the bar, we have D, F sharp, A, C, so it turns into a seventh chord, five, six, five, resolving to one in the third bar. So once we know what the harmonies are, we can begin to identify some of the embellishing notes. Sol, la, si. Well, that's pretty clearly a passing tone, and we have something similar um, underneath that uh, with the B flat, C, D moving in parallel sixths. So that's not so hard. How about the alto voice? D, C, D. By the end of the bar, first bar, we have a C minor chord, but the alto is still holding a D. It's a D that's tied over from the previous harmony. What do we call it when something ties over? The harmony changes, that note is now an embellishing note, and then it moves down by step to resolve. You're right, that's a suspension in the alto part. How about the very end of the first measure in the melody? Sol, la, si, la, sol, la, fa. By the end of the bar, that's a C minor chord. C, E flat, G. So the G is a chord tone. So what is that A? Sol, la, fa. That decoration of the motion from G down to F sharp, but it moves through an A as a decoration. What's the name for that? Sol, la, fa is an example of an échappé, or an escape tone, which is a special type of incomplete neighbor, approached by step and left by skip. The main thing going on in the melody there is sol, fa, which is decorated sol, la, fa, and that's how I explain that A as an escape tone. And we've pretty much explained everything in the first uh, three bars of the piece. So let's have another listen to the entire excerpt. You can think about the non-chord tones, the embellishing tones that we've analyzed here. And then let's think about the last two bars before the repeat sign. I've provided some Roman numerals to help a little bit. Uh, we're going to analyze that section of music in the key of D minor. So let's have another listen.
few things to say here. First of all, I said this passage is in D minor, but you'll notice that it ended with a D major chord. This is sometimes called a Picardy third. It simply means music in minor, but the final chord is turned into major to brighten a little bit. So most of the non-chord tones, the embellishing notes here, are passing tones, or specifically accented passing tones. Do, re, mi, re, re, mi, re. You can hear that the C sharp D E, that the D passing tone is on a stronger beat than the note that follows it. Same thing in the bass. La, si, do, re. The B is on a stronger position than the C sharp that follows it, and so on. Um, but there's a note that's a little bit tricky to deal with, and it is toward the end of the bar in the alto. Let me sing the alto part for that whole bar. Do, re, mi, re, re, do, re. How do I explain the D, where I probably have the question mark, toward the end of the bar? It's on a strong position and resolves down by step. That makes it either an appoggiatura or a suspension. What's the difference? How do I know which one it is? As we saw a bit earlier, the difference between appoggiatura and suspension is how a note is approached. So if I have do, re, mi, re, re, do, that D is a suspension because it is prepared. In the middle of the bar, we have a D minor chord. So D is a chord tone. At the end of the bar, I have an A dominant seventh chord. The D is restruck, repeated, and then resolves down by step. That makes it a suspension. So I've labeled it sus, and I've also labeled it in the figured bass. 4-3. Why? Because the suspension is a D going to a C-sharp, and if you measure the intervals from the bass, A up to D is a fourth, A up to C-sharp is a third. That's how I get my 4-3. So we've covered a lot of ground in this video, from the 17th century to the very late 19th century. We've analyzed some actually quite difficult excerpts by Baroque composers. Baroque music is known for its very ornate surfaces, lots of embellishments. So if you found some of these passages a little bit tricky to work through, that's totally understandable. What are the tips and takeaways from today's video? Number one, focus on the main notes to identify the harmonies. If you know which notes are in the harmony, then you can tell all the other notes must be embellishing notes. Embellishing tones can be classified by meter, accented versus unaccented, and by how they are approached and quitted, or how we get into them and how we leave them. For accented embellishing tones, the most common are passing and neighbor. Now, there is such a thing as accented passing and accented neighbor, but among the unaccented ones, the most common are passing and neighbor. Those are typically unaccented. For accented passing tones, the most common ones are suspension and appoggiatura. And as you saw today, they're quite similar. The difference is suspensions are prepared. Suspensions are tied over from the preparation or restruck, repeated from the preparation. Whereas appoggiaturas are approached by leap or by skip. Those are our two most common types of accented non-chord tones. And we've heard today that they have a particularly expressive effect. That covers it for today. Have a nice week.